Hello everyone, my name is Erin Kolwitz and I'm an associate professor of music at Northern Michigan University, way up here in the cold and sometimes balmy UP. Not really. Uh, so we're just doing some lectures today um, on women in music. I already did one on Hildegard at Biggin, episode one, and episode two will be about the ladies of Ferrara, Italy. So in the Renaissance, we did have some women that were able to perform um, and actually present music. In this case, there was a male composer sort of behind the scenes, but the women were the ones who really got um, the most acclaim for what they were doing. So first we need to talk about the Renaissance to really understand what was happening during this time. So the Renaissance, between 1400 and 1600, roughly, depends on who you talk to. Some people say that it started around 1450, ended a little bit later after 1600. It largely depended, of course, on where you were, where you were located in, uh, in Central Europe and uh, Western Europe. But for the most part, we say eh, between 1400 and 1600. So what was happening at that time? Well, certainly a very large em emphasis now being placed on secularism. Secularism. So basically what that means is we're moving away from the sacred. And it's not that church wasn't still the central, the central thing in people's lives. They were just finding their own individual identities as people. So with this comes a very large emphasis on human expression, of course, you probably already have figured out that this has a huge impact on the arts. So both performing arts and visual arts, architecture, food, all of the things of this nature um, become part of the humanist movement. So the Renaissance, we call it the rebirth, uh, but really what that means is an intellectual awakening. So a lot of people started to pursue intellectual endeavors, um, problem solving, science, uh, becomes part of the equation during this time. And more importantly, probably, was the return to classical study, so the return to philosophy. Uh, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, the study of all of these um, very large uh, legends, as it were, from G Greek antiquity become major players in the way that people thought and processed their lives. Uh, obviously, like I said, artistic innovations became really, really important. A lot of people put a lot of money into the arts, primarily dukes and duchesses and noblemen and things that people that had money put a lot of money into actually cultivating art. Uh, realism plays a huge part in this. We now move from 2D uh, in the Middle Ages. Art was primarily two-dimensional. And now we see a lot of three-dimensional paintings. And of course, pictures of bodies, pictures of humans in their natural form uh, becomes part of what uh, the vernacular was at that time. Um, the arts were used to express human emotion not only to worship God as it was considered to be, that was the primary goal in the Middle Ages was everything you did was to worship God. Things changed very much in the Renaissance. So what was happening with music at that time? Well, there was quite a lot of emphasis on church music, as you might imagine. Um, the singers, primarily male, are performing the music in the church, written also by male composers for the church. Uh, the exciting thing about this is this is sort of where choral music kind of finds its way. So the parts primarily were two, maybe uh, monophony, maybe just one part, maybe two parts, eventually expands to three parts, and then finally in the Renaissance we see four parts, even five or six parts. And we also see um, the codification of soprano, alto, tenor, bass. So soprano being on the top line, uh, alto being below the, the soprano, then the tenor, and bass being below the tenor. Um, the tenor had a lot of uh, ramifications in terms of the melody in the Middle Ages and also a little bit in the Renaissance, but primarily the melody has migrated at this point to the soprano part. So a lot of motets, masses, things like that being written for the church and uh, a lot of progress there as well. But at the same time, secular music was growing because people were looking for entertainment in their homes. So what better way to entertain yourself than sing a book of madrigals with your friends? And the text was often very body, very sexual. Obviously, it was good for entertainment and a lot of laughs. 
Uh, we also saw a rise in, in troubadour song, which existed well into the Middle Ages. Um, but basically you see one person accompanying themselves with some sort of plucked string instrument, uh, much like a guitar, the lute, or something of that nature. Uh, and this, of course, transferred into the courts. So these secular musicians were often hired by kings and queens, dukes and duchesses, and things of that nature to entertain their court. Think about a court, the concept of the court gesture, who was actually a paid musician. He was hired to pay... Uh, tell jokes, play instruments, and entertain the crowd. Uh, so th who are these ladies? They are called the Singing Ladies of Ferrara, but their Italian name was Concerto delle Donne, which literally means a consort of ladies. And what's really fascinating about this is that it was started by a man, the Duke of Ferrara, Alonso II. This was actually his brainchild. And much, much like people recruit star athletes for their teams, he was very interested in recruiting star singers and singers who were really good at what they did. And at that time they meant they could sing very high and they could sing very fluidly. So with a lot of melisma and embellishment, and they had that facility to be able to do that. We call those, now we call those coloraturas, uh, where they have the propensity to sing a lot of very fast notes with supreme accuracy. And that's who he was seeking out. So he found three women, and they were all of modest, uh, modest upbringing. They were not noble women or the daughters of noble women by any means. They were just regular people. And they were suddenly elevated to the status and they became almost like superstars. So this is happening around 1570 or so. Um, and they started a training program. So once those women retired, there, there was another woman to take their place. So young girls who had talent or showed promise were brought uh, to court and were trained by these three women that we'll meet in just a little bit. What's interesting about these women is that they were working for the court, of course, but the court, particularly the Duchess, decided that she wanted to have private parties in her rooms. So these private parties were by invitation only, and at these parties, the ladies of Ferrara would sing uh, recent compositions written by their court composer. So they would premiere these works, and they were owned by Alonzo II, exclusively he had the rights. So only the people that were at these parties were hearing this very special music. And they were finally named, these parties were named Musica Secreta, obviously secret music. And it was composed by their court composer, Luzasco Luzaski. And uh, he was fairly prolific, although we really only have a couple books of madrigals. Uh, that we know he wrote for one soprano, two, or three sopranos with continuo. So let's talk a little bit more about their style. Who were they? Well, their names are right here. The original three, Laura Pevarara, Anna Guarini, and Livia Darco. These women were the ones that were recruited by the Duke. Uh, they also had, at one point, a base, an actual male base, but he was fired for insubordination. So it was really just left with three, and then there eventually was a fourth woman as well. So what was their musical style like? Well, in the Renaissance, we were looking at things sort of through a square lens, for the most part. If we were looking at the Middle Ages, that was very circular. Uh, a lot of asymmetry and things like that. In the Renaissance, we were moving back towards symmetry because of the classical, the bend toward classical antiquity. Things should be very much in proportion. So it was a little unusual that their style was so uh, highly ornamented and very, very florid. So it had a, many, many melismas, many notes at one time in one breath. Uh, but what was remarkable is that these women could sing these very, very difficult passages. So the idea was to really show them off. And what happened was it brought a lot of prestige to the court of Ferrara, which was very lucky for them because then other groups sort of uh, spawned from this idea and this concept became very widely known throughout Europe, throughout Italy and throughout Europe. So part of what was really interesting about this is that their style not only involved the singing, but it involved hand motions and gestures and posture that would accentuate the text. So in the Renaissance, the text becomes very, very important. The poetry used in these madrigals becomes very important, and it's important that the audience knew 
and understood the concepts and the things that someone might be singing about. So using these stylized hand gestures and postures really help them to get their point across. What's interesting is that these gestures and things that they would use became very, it became a fad, it became very popular. So all of a sudden, all around Europe, everyone is using these same hand gestures and stylized movement while they are singing. So they were a little bit of a celebrity status and everything they did was watched very closely. Certainly, their role in the court and performing the way that they did changed the way women were viewed uh, as musicians from this point forward. So the song that I am going to suggest you listen to is called Io mi son giovanetta, which literally means I am a young girl. And this is from his Book of Madrigals, uh, from Lutsaski's Book of Madrigals. And this one in particular is for only two sopranos and continuo. So what that means is we have a keyboard instrument of some kind accompanying. Uh, in this day and age, it was probably a type of clavichord or harpsichord. Uh, where the strings were plucked so the sound wouldn't sustain as it does in a pianoforte like we have today, where the hammer hits and it sustains. In this case, it was likely a plucked instrument. The string is plucked, uh, and it gives it a much different feel and a much different sound. So I hope that you'll enjoy this, and I hope you'll listen to the YouTube recording here, The Secret Music of Lutzasco Lutzaski. And of course, this would have been sung by the ladies of Ferrara. Hope you have a wonderful day and thank you so much for listening. Stay